see this last Friday we were in Carlo and I got to see one of the engines I've always I've heard about you know since the 70s always wanted to see finally got to see it the A925 dual event cam 426 Hemi also known as Chrysler's doomsday device what an amazing piece of machinery this is it's actually a contemporary performance engine if you take apart any of any of the, the 21st century's you know hitter engines you're going to find pent roof combustion chambers four valve per cylinder dual overhead cams direct acting you know uh, cam shafts where you know the, the cam is actually hitting the you know the, the valve spring itself or the, the, the valve stem um, all modern stuff uh, Gilmer belt drive but here's the story this is this is what like led to the engine and you know why it you know it just disappeared um, you gotta go back to NASCAR I've never really been a fan or I've never I've never followed circle track racing really because um, you know as, as, a, as a mechanically oriented person I don't like the type of competition where the driver has so much control over what goes on and because I love cars I like to think of my machinery as being a little more permanent you know where circle track cars are like you know they're disposable right so so I never really got into it but studying this early period of NASCAR history uh, 1962 through 1965 um, it gives you all of the, 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 the roots of the engines that we have today, the, you know, the, the, the hitter engines. Uh, so, but anyway, really started in 1962. Uh, Chevrolet was the first with a, a, a NASCAR designed uh, V8, you know, from the ground up. So, okay, you go back then, Ford, uh, Pontiac had the, the 421 Super Duty. Uh, Ford had the, 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 the high riser motor, the, the, the 427, the side oiler, uh, and Chrysler was running the Max Wedge. Chevrolet took essentially the 409, uh, well actually what they did was they took the 409 crankshaft and the 409 dimensions and cast a different block around it and put what we know today as the big block Chevy heads. It was the, the, the Mark II Daytona mystery motor or the porcupine motor. So this thing was like far superior to all of the you know the inline wedge engines that were in competition at the time. Um, Chevy had problems with it, but not with the engine itself. It had problems with the systems around it. There were ignition failures and, and, and oiling problems and all sorts of things. But the actual engine itself proved you know that this was the way to make power. So Chrysler followed suit next. They took the 426 wedge block, they moved some cylinder bolts around, they added a couple of drain back holes and put the 426 Hemi heads on it. So, 1964, this was the thing. If you wanted to be a player in NASCAR, you had to have a NASCAR-designed engine. So, Ford counted this. The biggest problem with the 426 Hemi was the enormous weight of the valve train that was associated with, you know, getting the exhaust valves down there and the intake valves up here. You know, long rocker arms, heavy push rods, right? So, it took a severe valve spring to keep all of this stuff, you know, in place. Um, Ford figured that they could probably squeeze an extra 500,000 RPM out of the basic hemispheric or combustion chamber setup by going with the overhead cam. So you're eliminating the push rods, you're eliminating the lifters, uh, and you're down to just a, you know, a little bit shorter rocker. Well, Ford's used a, a less, a, you know, a narrower valve angle than the, than the Chrysler's did. Um, so by doing this, they eliminated all of that weight and the crazy fatigue that you know, huge valve springs led to. Um, now, before Ford was able to release this thing for competition uh, for the 1965 season, Chrysler got a handle on this and said, "All right, now wait. There's no way that our giant rockers and everything can compete with this." So they went full retard Cosworth, you know, Exotica on the Ford on the basic. 426 Hemi. The A925, what they did was they added a second camshaft. So you had a cam for the intake, a cam for the exhaust. There were no rockers. The lobes acted directly on uh, lash buckets that covered the valve springs and the valve stem. So there was no valve train weight. It was just the cams doing their thing. Um, they went to four valve per cylinder with a pent roof combustion chamber. One of the big problems with the 426 Hemi is that at high RPM, the dome of, you know, of a high compression 426 gets in the way of the mixture during the overlap period. 
So scavenging becomes a bit of an issue, which is why today uh, wedge engines or, or canted valve engines dominate all of the naturally aspirated types of racing where the Hemi will work with a blown uh, or a nitro, right? With a lower dome, they work fine. Uh, but anyway, that's all besides the point. The A925 uh, had all of these features, completely modern features. Uh, and one of the other advantages, and this is really, you know, what they never talk about with these engines, you know, when they talk about the A925 and the advantages that it would have had, is that because the cams were, were, were separate, you know, you could actually change the lobe separation angle uh, to suit, you know, whatever type, type of course you were on or, or weather conditions or anything like that. So this was like an infinitely tunable engine. Well, Ford sort of, uh, NASCAR I should say, saw that all of this stuff was running off the rails. So they made the rules that restricted anything that wasn't a production line engine for 1965. And uh, the only one that actually was able to, to skate through was the original you know, NASCAR engine, the, 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 the Daytona Mystery Motor. Uh, they released it as a 396 for its three production in 1965, and it went. So at any rate, the A925, the project was canned. Uh, they, there was no reason to go any further with it. Uh, during the testing, the final testing phases, before they actually built a running prototype, they would spin these engines up on an electric motor to like seven, 8,000 RPM and hold them there. And some of the, the lifter buckets had uh, cracked. So they didn't bother fixing them or anything like that. They just pulled the, 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 the pin on the project and scrapped everything. Somehow or another, at least one of these engines and at least one spare cylinder head made it out the, the, the door before you know it actually went for scrap. And that's the engine that's at Carlisle. The one lone cylinder head showed up on eBay a couple of years ago. I think it's off like ten thousand dollars for bare unfinished casting. But you know, really neat stuff. So you know, I just wanted to show you, you know, uh, bring you up to date on that thing. And uh, that's it. See you tomorrow.